Thank you for joining our Debbie's Dream Foundation Caring Stomach Cancer webinar. Today's webinar is on Social Security Disability and Family Medical Leave Act with advocate and attorney Martin Baba. I am Britt Aaron, Programs Director for Debbie's Dream Foundation. I will be moderating today's webinar. We would like to thank our sponsors, Genentech, Lilly Oncology, Merck, and Taiho Oncology for providing funding to make this webinar possible. You will be able to ask questions during this presentation. You can type your question into the question section that appears in the webinar menu. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation as time allows. In addition, the recording of this webinar will be accessible on our website in the lecture library. First, I will share information about stomach cancer and Debbie's Dream Foundation. Then we will hear a presentation on Social Security Disability and Family Medical Leave Act with Martin Baba. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer se session. In 2018, it was estimated that more than 26,000 Americans would be diagnosed with stomach cancer and more than 11,000 would die. Most patients are diagnosed at stage four when the five-year survival rate is only 5% and the incidence rates in younger populations has increased. Yet many know very little about this deadly disease and little research is being done. Pictured here is the founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation. Debbie was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer in April of 2008. She had no risk factors for stomach cancer and her symptoms were very vague. At the time, she was told that her chance of being alive in five years was only 4%. She endured harsh chemo regimens and targeted treatments and experienced many recurrences over nine and a half years. Unfortunately, Debbie passed away on December 23, 2017 at the age of 50. She dedicated herself to helping others with stomach cancer by raising awareness and providing resources and education. Debbie founded DDF in April of 2009. As an organization, we are now a member of several advocacy coalitions, including the Deadliest Cancer Coalition, the Patient Equal Access Coalition, the State Patient Equal Access Coalition, and One Voice Against Cancer. Debbie served for many years as a patient advocate on numerous committees and task forces. As, as an organization, DDF will continue her important work and legacy. Debbie's Dream Foundation is dedicated to advancing funding for stomach cancer research, raising awareness about stomach cancer, and providing education and support internationally to patients, families, and their caregivers. Our ultimate goal is to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. You can learn more by visiting our website at www.debbiesdream.org. In a few short years, DDF has achieved many great milestones. We have 29 chapters across the U.S., as well as chapters in Canada and Germany, and events are ongoing around the country. Our patient resource and education program helps patients, their families, and caregivers around the world by matching them with survivors and caregivers using disease-specific criteria, including age, stage, biomarkers, and location. We host educational webinars and symposia year-round, and our website contains an in-depth in-depth information about stomach cancer that can be translated into more than 60 languages. We have also provided $1 million in research grants to date and advocate each year during our Stomach Cancer Capitol Hill Advocacy Day to add stomach cancer to the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program. We will be returning to Washington, D.C. next February to maintain funding for researchers. These efforts have resulted in nearly 18 million being awarded to stomach cancer researchers over three fiscal years. Please consider joining us in February of 2020 in Washington. More information can be found on our website under the heading, Take Action. This is a current snapshot of our website's homepage with links to numerous resources. Here you can see some of the many events we have on the horizon, such as our, our, the third part of our legal series, which will be held on August 6th, our clinical trials webinar on September 6th, we are having our brunch in on the water in Fort Lauderdale on October 22nd, our annual night of laughter will take place in New York on October 6th, 
Our symposium will take place on the Dana-Farber Cancer, Cancer Research uh, Institute in Boston on October 19th. Our annual golf tournament in North Carolina will be on November 2nd. Our international symposium will be held on the Cleveland Clinic campus in Western Florida on November 9th. We will have another webinar on nutrition, eating through the holidays on November 13th. On uh, November 14th, we'll have our Fort Lauderdale Annual Golf Tournament, and we will have our last webinar for the year on precision medicine on December 6th. CDF is headquartered in Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Also on this slide are important phone numbers and email addresses you can use to contact our office and staff. We will now begin the presentation on Social Security Disability and Family Medical Leave Act, presented by Martin Baba. Martin is an eight-year stomach cancer survivor and DDF advocate. Martin has been practicing law in the state of Ohio for over 27 years. He has attended DDF's Advocacy Day for the past five years and hopes to further progress breakthroughs and treatment options for patients who have been afflicted by stomach cancer and their loved ones. As an adult, Martin has had somewhat of an unusual medical history in that he has experienced two different kinds of primary cancers. Initially, he was diagnosed and treated for a rare form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2006, and then diagnosed and treated with stage 3B diffuse gastric adenocarcinoma in 2011. As a lymphoma patient, Martin had a wealth of resources and options available to him, from clinical trials, cutting-edge standard treatment, a vast array of patient resources, and an overall sense that his stage 4 lymphoma diagnosis was treatable. As a gastric cancer patient, he saw that there was a stark difference in terms of patient resources, treatment options, and positive outcomes. Martin is often approached by other cancer patients and survivors and is asked for legal assistance. We thank him for joining us today, and now, Martin, I will turn the webinar over to you. Thank you, Britt. Next slide, please. Um, so we know that stomach cancer is a uh, disease, as the stomach cancer facts indicated, a disease that's uh, generally diagnosed when patients are symptomatic, that patients are uh, diagnosed in late stage disease. Next slide, please. Um, so we know that uh, with late stage disease, they're, they're, most people are going to be symptomatic. Um, there are challenges with the disease. Uh, there are also clear challenges with the treatment. So we undergo uh, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Uh, and we're hit with these two uh, challenges that affect our ability to work. So today I'm gonna to be talking about um, two programs, both administered by the Social Security Administration. Uh, we're certainly concerned about our ability to work, uh, our income, how we're gonna pay bills, how it affects ourselves and our families. The first uh, program that we're gonna talk about is Social Security Disability Insurance. So we sometimes call this SSDI. Um, it's available to disabled people who have already worked for a certain number of years. And then we're gonna talk about supplemental security income, which is also referred to as shorthand as SSI, which is available to disabled or elderly people whose incomes and uh, assets are very low. Next slide, please. Um, if you were with us in our first seminar last week, one of the key points that I would try to that I tried to make was that communication is the key to better better health care. And so as patients, um, we need to communicate effectively with our caregivers, with our family. We certainly need to communicate effectively with our uh, medical team. So just as effective and uh, successful medical treatment is dependent upon our telling um, our oncologists our symptoms and our uh, conditions, it's also important that we communicate through Social Security with our medical records. Next slide, please. Um, so here's a just, this general slide just tells you uh, where you get started. So the first one I would suggest 
is the best way to do uh, an application with Social Security, which is to do it online. Uh, you can also do it in person and you can do it in, by telephone. The reason why I suggest that patients apply online is because it's a process that can be started, paused, resumed, and given the fact that you uh, can do that, I think it's going to result in a better application uh, since people don't get overwhelmed with, um, you know, one initial visit to the Social Security office, uh, one telephone call. The, the online application is basically open 24-7. You can do it from your home. Um, it allows you to kind of proofread and review what you've uh, put in draft status and uh, subsequently submit it when it's all ready to go. Next slide, please. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about here is uh, SSI, um, Supplemental Security Income for SSI is uh, basically a means-tested program. So the, the first criteria is that someone needs to be disabled, um, one needs to be a U.S. citizen or an LPN, uh, your monthly income must be low. So uh, the, the general feeling or the general standard is only about half of your earned income will be taken into account, uh, but uh, the amount of income that you can earn is somewhere between like $700 and $1,400 a month. Now, th there is some state-specific um, criteria that uh, goes into account here, so you're going to have to check based upon your individual state what the maximum amount of income that you can earn. And then lastly, um, you can only hold so many assets. So there are different asset levels for single people uh, versus a married couple. Um, one of the key, one, there are two key distinctions between SSI and uh, SSDI in addition to it being uh, a, a poverty-based program. One is, is that benefits are paid in the first full month after the application is received, and secondly, that uh, uh, successful applicants will receive Medicaid coverage. Next slide, please. Um, Social Security Disability is a program where you must not only be disabled, but you also must uh, build up what are called sufficient work credits. Um, exactly how many credits you will need depends upon your age and the year you became disabled. You must have worked uh, some part of the five of the last 10 years before you become disabled. So the, the key takeaway here is, is that we know from, um, you know, recent uh, history that a lot of uh, stomach cancer patients now are being diagnosed as young adults. So you certainly can have situations where we have uh, young adults that are diagnosed in their early 20s or mid-20s, and they may not have developed a work history. So um, there's an there's a important point here that not everyone is going to be uh, eligible for SSDI. On the other hand, you could have someone who is an older individual who's been removed or not active in the workforce in the last 10 years, and they also might not be covered. Um, now, if, you're, if your application is approved, uh, your Social Security di disability benefits will include cash payments in an amount determined based upon your personal earnings record. So um, your uh, high earners are gonna pay higher FICA taxes when they're employed. They're gonna end up with a larger benefit. Um, average payments on the other, average payments will range anywhere from a thousand to say $1,500 a month. After collecting disability benefits for 24 months, you will become eligible for Medicare, regardless of your age. And in the meantime, you will, um, if your income is low, you'll qualify for Medicaid. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the first question is, what is a disability? Well, unlike other types of disability, which we're not gonna talk about here today, um, 
Social Security uh, takes an all or nothing approach to disability. So if you've ever uh, encountered disability issues with disability insurance, with uh, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, perhaps you've heard of people being 50% disabled or 75% disabled. Uh, Social Security, again, takes an all or nothing approach. The claimant must be uh, totally disabled and unable to be gainfully, gainfully, gainfully employed, and they must meet a specific criteria. Next slide. So how, how does Social Security determine um, whether or not uh, an applicant is disabled? Well, it has its own medical experts and it has its own uh, claim, and, claim examiners. So these people are gonna look through uh, a patient's medical records and determine whether or not the medical records support uh, the finding or the claim of disability. And so this is why it's critical that uh, patients are familiar with their medical record, uh, they review it carefully, and that their medical record reflects their condition. So the, this is all based upon uh, you know, effective communication between the patient and their medical team. Next slide, please. So um, the, the good thing about, uh, if there is anything good about being diagnosed with stomach cancer is that unlike other disabilities, um, stomach cancer is a condition that so security has designated as a compassionate allowance condition. So uh, one of the things that people may have uh, heard about Social Security is, is that it's a timely process. It takes forever. Um, it can take months or years to get a successful award. That is true. Um, stomach cancer does have some special consideration. Now, there are some cancers that are included in the special, uh, the special fast track program that are treated a little bit differently and better than stomach cancer. So in, in instances where uh, persons have, for example, gallbladder cancer, pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer, those cancers require just a simple diagnosis. So Social Security uh, has designated certain cancers where if you're simply diagnosed, regardless of stage, um, you automatically will qualify for either SSI or SSDI. Stomach cancer is not automatic. Um, it does require a certain amount of disease progression, um, and uh, it's not automatically awarded just simply based upon diagnosis. And we're gonna kind of talk about you know, different stages of the disease this afternoon and to see how the different stages fit into the requirement. Um, the other thing I'm gonna point out here is, is that this compassionate allowance condition does not require a separate uh, application. So the Social Security Administration will see that the applicant is uh, asking for a disability diagnosis with stomach cancer and it will automatically go into this program. Next slide, please. So um, basically we have what we call a five-step disability determination process. And this, these are the steps that the Social Security Administration follows to determine whether or not a claimant is going to be awarded a benefit. The first question basically in a nutshell is, what are you working? Um, and so Social Security uses this magical term that's referred to as substantial gainful activity. Well, what does that mean? It means, or it refers to the question about whether or not uh, the claimant is doing either full or part-time work. What's Social Security gonna look at? Well, they're gonna look at the type of work that you do, uh, the dates that you went to work, the dates that you did not go to work, changes or accommodations that may have been made in your job duties, um, extra help that you may have needed uh, at work, um, and extra uh, absences as well. Uh, now, fundamentally, 
patients need to kind of think carefully about whether they want to apply for disability. I mean, they're, different people are going to react differently to their disease. Different people are going to respond differently to their uh, treatment. And not everyone is going to want to step away from their work. So one of the other myths I think that we encounter with Social Security disability is, is that there are a lot of people that are gaming the system and freeloading and they're not really disabled. Well, I think the, the reality is, and I've uh, anecdotally uh, heard this from um, the surgeons and physicians that I've uh, talked to uh, in preparation for this uh, webinar, that there are a lot of pe there are more people that can qualify for disability than actually apply for it or submit claims. Um, I know when I was diagnosed, I felt that it was important for me to make um, my treatment as a priority, but I also felt that I did not want to walk away from my, my career because there's certainly, um, it's difficult to just kick up and leave from your job, from your career, and go on hiatus. And uh, I just felt that it was basically better for me um, to do as much work as I as I could. Everyone's going to have their own uh, history, and everyone's going to have their own experience. So I think this is something that we need to talk with, you know, uh, our caregivers about, with our medical team about whether it makes sense to, um, you know, apply for disability. Next slide, please. So if you've made that determination that um, you want to pursue the disability determination. The second step that we must um, uh, satisfy is that uh, that we're severely impaired. So step two of the Social Security the pro uh, process requires that uh, a claimant's uh, disability or impairment will significantly limit their ability to perform work. And so that this of, of all the steps we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon, uh, step two is probably the most easily satisfied um, because obviously stomach cancer is severe. Next slide, please. So the next step, step three, refers to what we call um, the blue book. And this, in this, the blue book basically refers to uh, a manual that contains what we call a listing of impairments. So there are, there's a book, um, there are various medical conditions that are included in that book. Uh, they include things like musculoskeletal musco disorders, neurological disorders, uh, disorders of uh, mental health disorders, and uh, obviously like cancers or malignancies. Uh, if uh, claimant meets the listing at step three. We don't need to go to step four and step five, which we'll talk about later. Um, they basically win or they get a successful claim and you, um, you, you get your award from Social Security. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of this blue book, uh, it's available online. Uh, it's a public record. Uh, we can we can find cancers in section or chapter 13 of the blue book, uh, listing 13.6 specifically addresses stomach cancer, but also covers esophageal cancer. Uh, one tip or suggestion is that if you are going to apply for Social Security, uh, again, this is something that you want to communicate with your medical team. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the specific listing, I've uh, created a slide here which has the exact uh, language from the slide, or I'm sorry, from the listing. Um, and specifically, we can look at 13.16B, which deals with carcinoma or carcinoma or sarcoma of the stomach. So if we look at 13.16B, it says that we're required to have uh, conditions as described in one or two. Number one indicates inoperable, unresectable, 
uh, extending the surrounding structures or recurrent. And then number two says it's there's that there's metastasis or uh, involvement beyond regional lymph nodes. Next slide, please. All right, so the terms that are listed in 13.16 uh, do have clear definitions. Uh, inoperable basically means that your oncologist or your medical team has determined that surgery is not beneficial. Um, unresectable, on the other hand, is a little bit different. It is basically where there has been a surgery but uh, the cancer has not been completely removed. And here we would see pathology reports um, that would indicate that there were po positive margins. Uh, recurrent disease uh, refers to cancer that's been treated, but there's been a recurrence. So we know that with stomach cancer, um, the, the, the likelihood of recurrence after being diagnosed and treated with late stage disease is high, that there's a higher incidence of recurrence in the first year, and then in, in the second year a little bit less, and then it, can, it, it continues to tail off and the farther uh, patients get from their initial diagnosis and successful treatment, the less likely it's um, going to recur, but certainly it's, it, it, it's a concern that patients have. Uh, surrounding structures would refer to um, incident or cases where the tumor is going to grow outside of the stomach, to the colon, the spleen, or to the liver. Uh, next slide, please. So um, how does Social Security or what is Social Security looking for? Well, uh, Social Security is looking for medical evidence. Uh, th these can include pathology reports, radiology reports, uh, reports from your oncologist, notes from your surgeon, um, and these are the things that adjudicators are looking for. Uh, in the absence of these reports, um, there also may be a need to get a physician's opinion uh, that indicates that the cancer is inoperable or unresectable. Uh, Next slide, please. So th this slide here shows you um, a little bit of an anatomy regarding uh, the stomach. A couple things that I'm going to point out regarding the listing. So the listing does not refer to stages. So there's nothing in the listing that says that uh, stage zero or stage one, two, three, and so on and so forth are automatically listed uh, or successful. Secondly, uh, the listings don't describe the number of nodes. So it's patients uh, we often talk to our uh, oncology team about the significance or the amount of nodal involvement. And node counting is something that goes into, uh, you know, our, our how, how significant our disease is. But the stomach cancer listing for Social Security does not count nodes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one tool that is helpful for us in terms of diagnosis is the TNM staging system. So um, if you are to look at your medical records, um, you'll see something where you've been diagnosed and the TNM is going to refer to the tumor size, the number of nodes that are involved and whether there's metastasis. Next slide, please. So here's just an example of a um, medical record or a pathology report from an oncologist. Um, there's some narrative description about um, the gastric cancer and then uh, the, the TNM uh, references their uh, T3, N3, N0. So I think in terms of like my preparation for the materials here, the, the most important thing I think that you're gonna look at is probably, um, you know, the, the, the T number, it seems like the higher the T number, and we'll go into the, we're gonna kind of go into the weeds here pretty quickly, that the greater the likelihood that someone's going to uh, qualify for disability. Next slide, please. 
So what I'm going to do now is kind of work through the slides, or I'm sorry, work through the stages and apply them to the listings. So in terms of like stage zero and up to stage uh, 2A disease, um, the likelihood is the, the, the patient's probably not going to, to meet the listing. Um, when we go to stage 2B, um, you'll see here that staging in and of itself is not necessarily determinative in terms of social security disability and whether one qualifies. So we see here that with stage 2B, stage 2B disease, when um, clinicians have uh, this model in terms of how they uh, designate or classify diseases, stage 2B uh, disease uh, leads to different results as it relates to the Social Security uh, model. Um, if you go to bullet point number three, we can have stage uh, 2B disease where there's T3, N1, M0. Um, that disease has not grown into the peritoneal lining or the serosa. Uh, and then if we look at T4 disease, that disease has grown into the peritoneal lining, and um, uh, the, the likelihood is that patient is going to qualify for disability. Uh, I think the takeaway here as we talk about uh, further stages is that uh, I think it's important for patients to be careful of um, you know, who they talk to, because not every stage 2B uh, cancer diagnosis is the same, particularly as it relates to Social Security. So you might have uh, pa patients or caregivers in our support community that may have qualified for Social Security and they may have been stage 2B. Um, you might be stage 2B as well. And there's the question as to why, um, you know, one person qualified and another didn't. And it, it could very well be because of these uh, nuances in terms of staging. Next slide, please. So if we look at stage three disease, um, it gets a little bit more tricky. Um, you can see that some stage three disease at stage 3A uh, contemplates that there has been um, spread to a certain number of lymph nodes but it has not spread to other organs. Um, you can have situations where stage 3A disease uh, has not grown into the peritoneal lining. It has not uh, escaped the uh, various sublayers of the stomach. And in those situations, um, the likelihood is that the patient is not going to meet the listing. On the other hand, uh, we can have stage three disease where it has grown into um, nearby organs or structures, and clearly that person is going to meet the listing um, for uh, disability. Next slide, please. Uh, here again, we're looking now at stage three B disease. Um, very nuanced uh, uh, descriptions of what the disease entails. Um, so stage 3B disease may involve um, a certain number of lymph nodes. Uh, it may have gone to distant parts of the body. It may not have. It may have spread. Uh, again, your patient is going to need to review their medical records with their oncologist to determine whether or not their particular disease condition is going to fit within the Social Security listing. So one thing we talked about last week was that one size does not fit all. And so this applies here as well, so that every stage uh, two, stage uh, 3A, stage 3B cancer, it's not the same as it relates to Social Security and the disability claim. Next slide, please. Um, stage 3C, on the other hand, we start to get into situations where the likelihood is that 
it's automatic that the patient is going to uh, qualify for disability. Um, and then stage four, by, de de by definition, uh, is metastatic disease, and um, that automatically qualifies one for disability. Next slide, please. So again, what we talked about earlier is, is that Social Security has a five-step process. Um, step one was whether or not the uh, applicant or the claimant is uh, substantially gainfully employed. In other words, are they working? Uh, step two is um, are they uh, suffering from an illness or condition that is severe? And then step three is basically does one meet the listing of impairments? So given the fact that uh, most patients are diagnosed um, with stomach cancer at late stage disease, the likelihood is, is that most uh, patients will qualify under the listings. Uh, they'll fit neatly into these boxes and they will um, get um, their award approved. Um, next slide, please. So there are certainly situations where um, a person is diagnosed with um, stomach cancer and they don't nicely, neatly fit into these listings. So what do they do? Well, they're this is where you go on to uh, step four and step five. Um, step four basically is asking whether or not um, you can do the work that you did in the past. If Social Security determines that you can do the same work with your disease, your application will be denied. If on the other hand, Social Security determines that you uh, cannot do the same work, then you go to step five, which is going to ask, um, can you do any other work? So the, the takeaway from this slide is that um, people that are not uh, neatly fitting into this, this listing um, can win their case or get successful approval without meeting the blue book. So we, we call this basically um, equaling the listing. Uh, the way this is done is that um, the, the applicant is going to uh, medically demonstrate that he or she is not able to perform the work that they've done in the past. Next slide, please. So um, we know that um, this slide shows chemotherapy. But um, you know, we know that stomach cancer um, treatment is uh, a significant challenge. Um, the effects of chemotherapy um, can include fatigue, nausea, uh, brain or chemo fog. Um, it, it can be. It's, it certainly is, it can be debilitating, and we also know that the um, effects of surgery are significant as well. So people have pain, they can have uh, infection post-operatively. Uh, many patients have difficulty feeling full uh, and that results in uh, you know, very difficult situations as far as eating and drinking. Uh, there's dumping syndrome, uh, weight loss, uh, B12 deficiency. So certainly there are uh, a whole host of side effects that different patients can to, then that different patients can experience that are going to uh, impair or compromise their ability to perform their work on a full-time basis. And so this is what we refer to as a medical vocational allowance. Next slide, please. So now we go back, now we go to uh, step four. And the basic question here with step four is, can you do the work that you've done in the past? 
Uh, Social Security is going to look at the claimant's um, work over the last 15 years and determine whether or not he or she um, can perform that past work. Uh, residual functional capacity, or RFC, is a term that comes up in, in steps four and five. So RFC, or resi residual functional capacity, refers to uh, whether the claimant or the client, uh, what they can do, taking into account the restrictions of their current condition. Um, one point that I'm going to make here, it's critical that you're uh, that you provide Social Security with medical evidence proving your functional limitations um, due to your experience of, you know, having the chemotherapy, the radiation, and or the surgery. Uh, the way that Social Security is going to review these situations is based upon your, doc your doctor's treatment notes, your hospital records, and the results of diagnostic testing. So this could be MRIs, CT exams, blood tests, um, tumor biopsies, so on and so forth. Um, it's also possible to get supporting uh, documentation from your coworkers, your family, your friends, and, 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 and neighbors and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, much like how the Blue Book listing varies depending upon who is applying, uh, the medical vocational allowance will vary depending upon your age, your work history, and how much your cancer and its treatment affect um, or limit your ability to earn income. So in terms of step five, uh, Social Security is not looking at your past work, but whether or not there are any jobs that you can do now that are less physically or mentally demanding. Um, in terms of uh, practical real-world situations, um, older adults, uh, in other words, a, uh, persons over age 50, tend to have a, an easier time uh, qualifying for a disability under a medical vocational allowance because Social Security believes it's harder for people over the age of 50 to get retrained for another job. Uh, people without college degrees also will have an easier time qualifying as Social Security Administration generally feels that college degrees is evidence that people possess the skill to go to some other desk job uh, or some job that's perhaps less physically demanding either during or after their treatments. Uh, finally, if you've worked active and physically demanding jobs, you'll have probably a better success rate qualifying for the medical vocational allowance as it's more likely that you're too ill uh, to work on your feet all day um, as opposed to someone who does uh, sedentary work or uh, is in an office setting. Next slide, please. Okay, so. Um, there are certainly situations where uh, people don't qualify automatically or as a result of uh, meeting the listings that we've talked about. Then there are situations where people will attempt to uh, file a claim and they uh, don't equal or meet the listing through this medical vocational allowance and they've been denied their disability. Next slide. So there's a process um, that, that, that is followed um, in terms of what happens when uh, a claimant is denied from Social Security. The first thing is what we call a reconsideration. So basically what a reconsideration is, is where the uh, medical record goes to a different examiner and it basically gets the sec a second look. Now, the, the claimant can certainly supplement the record if there are additional, rec there are additional medical records or um, something was missing, uh, the record can be supplemented. But um, the reconsideration is basically an in-office uh, type of review. Uh, it's important that claimants be mindful of uh, 
things like mail from the Social Security because it's going to have uh, particular due dates and deadlines. Uh, the two deadlines here that we're looking at uh, for the reconsideration and for uh, a judicial hearing is 60 days. So if the reconsideration um, following the initial application fails, then claimants have the right to see an, an administrative law judge. So um, this is a court proceeding. Uh, it's a little bit different from uh, most court hearings in several ways. Number one, uh, the rules of evidence don't apply. So um, as attorneys, or if we're in trial and court cases, we have to be mindful of uh, things like hearsay, where records came from, to bring in people to testify as to the authenticity of certain medical, medical records. Uh, the rules of evidence do not apply in, in the administrative law judge hearing in Social Security. Uh, the second thing is, is that it's, non, it's not adversarial. So in other words, if a claimant is before an administrative law judge, uh, there's going to be a judge in the courtroom, um, but there's not going to be someone from Social Security, uh, an attorney or some other staff member who's trying to argue against the claimant. Now, there may be people in the hearing uh, that may provide testimony and evidence, such as a vocational expert or a medical expert, um, so that, that there may be other actors that are people that are going to be subject to uh, testimony and cross-examination in that hearing. Um, if, if, if a claimant goes through these two, pro the, these two appeals processes and still has an unfavorable uh, result, then there's another layer called the Appeals Council. And lastly, they can go into federal district court and file an appeal there. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, I think the takeaway in terms of like uh, what we've talked about this afternoon is, is that uh, not everyone is the same. One size does not fit all. Um, communicate with your uh, healthcare team or your oncology team about how you fit into these listings. Uh, the next thing we're going to just talk about briefly here is just FMLA or what's called the Family Medical Leave Act. Next slide, please. So um, an overview about uh, FMLA is that it's, it was set up to protect individuals who need to take time off from work due to their illness or to care for a family member. So this is something that is uh, applicable or relevant to not only patients, <clears throat> but also caregivers. Um, FMLA entitles eligible employees to take up, up, up to 12 work weeks of unpaid job and benefit protected leave in a 12 month period for specified family and medical reasons. So the good is, is that it applies to both patients and caregivers. And the bad is, is that not every employee is eligible. So one of the reasons why I wanted to include a portion um, in this presentation regarding FMLA is, is that, you know, within the stomach cancer community, I've seen people ask questions about FMLA and uh, people speaking from their own experience state, well, I, I applied for it, I was granted it, and um, there are other patients and caregivers wondering why their employer didn't grant it to them. So we'll talk about that here next. Next slide, please. So not everyone is covered by FMLA. So just as we talked about earlier, that not everyone is eligible for SSDI due to their work history. Not everyone is eligible for FMLA. So this slide will tell you um, what exactly uh, needs to be in place in order for FMLA to be applicable. Uh, number one, your employer has to be required to provide FMLA. Uh, the starting point is, is that the employer has to be uh, one that is either a public agency, an elementary or grade school, or an employer that has 50 or more employees. So if uh, someone is working for 
a small business and they have 10 employees or 15 employees, that business is not covered by FMLA. Uh, what's the, the, the solution? Well, the solution is, is that there needs to be communication, obviously, um, between the patient and his or her employer about seeing whether or not um, the employer is uh, willing to accommodate the employee. The next thing is, is that the employee needs to have uh, worked at their job for at least 12 months. So um, patients that are uh, diagnosed with uh, disease and they're newly with their employer, uh, their employer may have over 50 employees, but they might fall out of protection of FMLA due to the fact that they haven't been there for a year. Uh, the next uh, requirement is, is that the employer uh, or the employee must have worked uh, at least 1,250 hours for the uh, employer in the past 12 months. So this could, uh, you know, kick out people that are working for a large employer that have uh, worked there for 12 months but have only worked with their employer say like on a part-time basis. And then lastly, um, FMLA criteria requires that the employer has 50 or more employees uh, within uh, 75 miles of the job site. Next slide, please. Well, I guess that's our last slide. So that, uh, that, that concludes our, our, my presentation this afternoon about uh, social security disability and um, a little bit about FMLA, and um, I'll be happy to take any questions at this point in time. Thank you so much for sharing with us today, Martin. Uh, we did receive some questions during your presentation, so I'd like to ask you a few in our remaining time. Um, the first question, if I win my claim, am I eligible for back payments? So the answer to that is yes. Um, back payments are paid for months um, between uh, the date that you applied for your disability benefits <clears throat> and the date that you were, that you were approved, so there's a there's a time lag between the the date that the applicant or the claimant goes into the Social Security office or applies online, and when they get notice of being approved. That could be a couple weeks, it could be a couple months, um, but there's this time period. So generally speaking, um, due to the uh, you know the the the, the process of uh, filing the application, the the wait, and the approval date. There's this gap period. Um, as we talked about in, in the presentation, um, SSDI benefits. There's a required five month waiting period. So if you're eligible to receive um, back pay, um, there will be some back award. Um, another type of back payment that can apply um, in these kind of cases is that there may be some retroactive application of the benefits. So retroactive uh, benefits are basically benefits that are paid for months when um, the patient or the applicant initially became disabled. So we refer this uh, as the disability onset date and when you applied for your benefits. So there are definitely um, uh, back payments that people can get, and they can relate back to both when um, the, the, the applicant actually made the application and even to when the disease um, was initially diagnosed. That's great to hear. Um, the next question, what if I think I'm ready to return to work, but I'm not entirely sure? Well, um, Social Security has what we call a trial work period and it allows uh, persons that are receiving social security disability to kind of test the waters in terms of going back to work while still receiving um, their monthly benefit. So, you know, I think most people that are receiving disability, they, 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 would, they would like to go back to work, but there's certainly some cautiousness and some apprehension about whether or not physically they can do that. So the way that um, Social Security Administration accommodates the situation is, is that it has this trial work period 
and basically it consists of um, a total of nine months that don't necessarily have to be consecutive. And during these nine months, a person can um, earn um, an unlimited amount without lowering their cash benefit. Um, but um, after that time period, um, you know, the Social Security Administration and the applicant or the, the, the beneficiary are going to have to uh, figure out whether or not um, the disability is going to continue or whether it's going to terminate. So the, the, the last point that I would make about the trial work period is, is that a finding of disability is not um, a permanent uh, situation. So if we have uh, survivors on a long-term basis, um, they can expect that their claim will be reviewed. It's not something that they can um, necessarily bank on um, for the rest of their lives. But again, I think most people um, would be eager to go back to work. They would be um, a little bit apprehensive about doing so. And this is a way to kind of um, uh, accommodate that kind of situation. Great. Thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time for more questions today. Uh, Martin, thank you again for joining us and sharing your expertise. This webinar was brought to you by Debbie's Dream Foundation. The recorded version of this and past webinars can be found in the lecture library on our website. We'd like to thank our sponsors again, Genentech, Lilly Oncology, Merck, and Taiho Oncology for, for providing funding to make this webinar possible. We'd also like to remind you about our upcoming events. You can find the rest of our events on our website. Uh, make sure you join us for the third part of our legal series, Financial and Insurance Issues, which will be in two weeks on August 6th. And again, we'd like to thank all of our listeners today. This concludes today's presentation. Please be on the lookout for more information about our upcoming webinars for this year. And to view any of our recorded webinars, especially today's, please visit our lecture library and search by topic. And you can search by the topic that interests you. We'd also love to hear your feedback, questions, and thoughts. So please be sure to take this survey at the end of the webinar once it concludes. And for any questions or suggested topics for future webinars, send your comments to programs or uh, patient.resource at debbiesdream.org. And for more information, you can always visit our website at www.debbiesdream.org. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a great day.